Hello, everyone. Um, I haven't really met any of you properly because I wasn't here yesterday, so it's nice to see you. Hopefully, I get to know you a bit better. Um, yeah, and it's a bit intimidating speaking when you weren't here the day before. Just to, I'm not quite sure if this is going to be pitched in exactly the same way as yesterday's stuff. I hope so. Um, but in this paper, um, I want to look at some connections between phenomenology, gestalt psychology, embodied cognition, and non-reductive metaphysics. Uh, insofar as these overlapping methodologies can be employed in work on intersubjectivity specifically, which is what my PhD research is on. So in my PhD, I'm looking at non-reductive analyses of um, triadic or multi-person intersubjectivity, namely intersubjective interactions between more than two subjects, which I'll outline in a bit more detail. And so part of this project, I want to defend the legitimacy of the claim that we can attend to more than one other person at once, holding multiple others um, as, a, as the focus of attention, um, and as and we can attend to multiple other people as a unified whole. I'm going to argue it's legitimate to talk about attending to, perceiving, and addressing multiple others at the same time as a gestalt whole. And I'm going to argue that this can be identified in the phenomenology um, of these kinds of interactions and in an analysis of the core underlying structural features of these interactions. So I'm going to make this case first by outlining which aspects of gestalt qualities I take to be relevant to this analysis. Um, I'm going to outline why I think multi-person intersubjectivity can be understood to exhibit gestalt structure and gestalt qualities, uh, looking at the phenomenology of these interactions to do that. I'm going to argue that kind of some of the classic phenomenological analyses of temporality can help us think about multi-person intersubjectivity and uh, give us a reason to reject a kind of what I think is a reductively dyadic analysis of intersubjectivity. And then finally, I'm going to just draw on a few empirical, like bits of um, empirical research that I think support my claim. So that's kind of, that's where I'm tracking. Um, but so just to kind of situate what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm coming from the philosophy of intersubjectivity and I'm sort of, I'm quite new to gestalt psychology and embodied cognition. So it is a bit intimidating to be in front of people who I know will know a lot more about it. But I hope to learn from you. Uh, but so in the philosophy of intersubjectivity, most, of, most work has been focused on two, two different types of intersubjectivity, uh, namely uh, IU intersubjectivity, so the kind of the second personal, second person standpoint, and we intersubjectivity, so the first person plural. These are the two main uh, things that are looked at in this area. So just really, really briefly to sketch how those two types of intersubjectivity are characterized. Um, the, the IU encounter is um, concerned with kind of mutual attention between a pair of people. So you are the focus of my attention. I am the focus of your attention. And we take up this position where I can address you as you. And, and that's reciprocal. You're able to do that to me. Um, the structure of we intersubjectivity um, has all the participants kind of collected around a common object with a focus, and that could be that could be a literal object or an event or a task, um, a belief, um, and they're attending to it together. So there's this joint attention structure where uh, everyone's aware of everyone else, kind of in the periphery of their awareness, and they're aware that we're that we are all uh, attending to the same thing. We have this kind of sharedness, jointness, uh, a kind of alongsideness that creates a shared world. That's kind of the structure of the we. And there's a lot, lot more that could be said about these two types, but I'm just going to leave it at that brief sketch for now because I kind of want to get onto other things. Um, so the the kind of where I'm starting is that uh, there are a number of people who will say that uh, these these two types of intersubjectivity 
uh, can be understood non-reductively. Um, so they, they can't be sufficiently analyzed in terms of their kind of uh, the, atom, the atomistic addition of each, each of the individual subjects. Um, not, not everyone necessarily agrees with that, but a lot of people uh, will take that, take that line. But this kind of contemporary work on intersubjectivity, I think, is understood, generally speaking, through uh, a lens of dyadic intersubjectivity. So dyadic intersubjectivity is the paradigm. And by contrast, I argue that a non-reductive account of triadic and multi-person intersubjectivities can be given. So I'm interested in some of the more complex intersubjective structures and standpoints uh, that emerge in these kind of, when you have more than two people. Um, and so three examples of uh, these kinds of, these kinds of multi-person interactions, um, I would call the, the I use, so the second person plural address, where I address more than one other at the same time. And then you, uh, you can, you can kind of flip that around and think you can have a we, you address where we as a collective address an other or, and then kind of a combination of those, a we, use or a y'all, whatever your second person plural preference is. Um, so we can kind of think of kind of reflection on everyday interactions, I hope, brings these things to mind. We say to a couple, who posted us, thank you for your hospitality. The you there is addressed as a second person plural address, um, and so on. And so I think this is not just, it's not just playing with words here, but there's really a phenomenology attached to recognizing and relating to um, a pair, for example, as a pair. Um, and that this isn't just two separate IU interactions that are happening in parallel, um, but there is this uh, second person plural address that is, is structured into the interaction. I am addressing use at the moment, for example. So, and this kind of structure, I'm gonna stick with the second person plural address to keep it simple. There's, there's obviously many, as I've already indicated, different types of multi-person address. Um, but the IU structure, which is minimally triadic, has to have at least three people, um, I argue should be understood as a non-reductive, uh, sorry, as sort of non-reducible, unified, intersubjective whole, just as an IU or a we experience is an intersubjective whole. So, again, this is very brief, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to plow on, and if you have any questions about some of this stuff, uh, we can get to it in the question time. So the position I'm arguing for stands opposed to the claim that uh, these various multi-person inter in interactions can be analysed sufficiently in terms of their constituent dyads. The dyadic approach will claim that to address a group or a pair is a matter of kind of surface grammar, if you like. Uh, that when, when we engage in a second perso personal address, I mean, it, it looks like we're addressing multiple people, but when we look at what's actually going on, we're, we are addressing one person at a time, if you like, and that person might be the sort of, the spokesperson for the, the whole we that they're involved in, but we can, ultimately we can break down into dyads my address to one person and the various dyads that make up the group that I'm addressing. And the thought here is that while I might be able to be peripherally aware of others when I address this kind of primary other, or while I might be able to bring content about other others into my address, um, actually the, the focus of my attention, my awareness can only be one other person at a time and I might be able to switch between these kind of second person singular standpoints, perhaps very rapidly, and it might seem like I'm addressing 
um, more than one person. But again, the dyadic approach will say this is not strictly true. And I think we find this kind of dyadic approach in um, many of the classic phenomenologists like Sartre, Buber, and Levinas, and then in some kind of contemporary intersubjectivity theorists as well, like Peter Stawalska. And by contrast, I argue that these multi-person interactions not only can't be reduced to uh, kind of the mere addition of their individual subjects, but they also can't be reduced to the addition of these individual dyads. I want to argue that the second person plural is not simply a matter of surface grammar, but is as metaphysically substantial as, for example, the, the first, second, and third person singular standpoints. And specifically, I want to explore the idea that multi-person interactions of the kind I identify have uh, gestalt qualities. So there's, I think there's two aspects to this. Um, one is that if I'm, if I'm analyzing a multi-person interaction kind of third personally, as it were, sort of as I'm doing now as I'm talking about it, those multi-person interactions as a whole um, uh, can be said to have uh, gestalt qualities. They can't be reduced to their individual, uh, either their monads or their dyads. But secondly, uh, thinking about the phenomenology of perception through the lens of gestalt psychology helps us think about how we engage as participants in multi-person intersub intersubjective interactions. So I argue we can recognize and address multiple others as uh, these kind of unified relational units or wholes. And I think these addresses are meaningful and possible um, insofar as we recognize interactions between another and a third person, for example, as well as between oneself and others. We recognize others together as relational wholes in virtue of the, the kind of the structure that they exhibit. So, and I'll talk more about that. Okay, so just to, to jump to some basics of how I've come to think about Gestalt's structure uh, and then how I'm applying this. So I'm engaging uh, Gestalt theory as an articulation of the phenomenology of perception insofar as uh, it describes what it's like to perceive the form or the structure of things as well as the individual components of an object. We perceive things and people as unified wholes insofar as we perceive their form or their structure. So to just think about Gestalt qualities more generally, to get into this, I want to focus on the famous example of perceiving Gestalt qualities uh, orally in listening to a piece of music. So Aaron Fels used this example when he talks about temporal Gestalt qualities. So when we listen to a piece of music, we don't just hear a set of notes in isolation from one another. Otherwise, we wouldn't hear it as a piece of music. We'd never hear a melody, which is a unified whole. Each note has a place in the structure of the whole. And the phenomenology of each part is constituted uh, not just by the immediate impression, but its place within the whole. So the musical case, I think, brings, brings to attention more clearly how um, a multiplicity of individual perceptions, in this case musical notes, stand in this complex set of relations to one another, creating patterns. And these patterns, these relations, these sets of relations, uh, we perceive as the form of music. Um, and it's notable uh, that this musical example is also used by Husserl, bringing in the phenomenology in his analysis of the lived experience of temporality or time consciousness. And he, he famously articulates this in terms of the threefold structure of impression, retention, and protention. Um, so he, he also ex he articulates this idea of uh, at any moment when we're listening to a piece of music, we, uh, we hear the, the immediate impression, but we also retain in consciousness kind of within the horizon of the, of, of the impression, 
what has just come, and we reach forward, we protend towards that which is to come. Um, we recognize events in unfolding in time as unified wholes rather than this set of disconnected moments. Um, uh, that's, so that's probably all quite familiar. Of course, uh, retention is not the same as uh, recollection or memory from any other point in the past, and protension is not the same as expectation of something further off in the future. Retention and protention are constitutive features of every lived experience, and they make so these these features for retention and protention make possible uh, what it is to, to perceive events as unfolding and connected. Uh, unlike remembering or anticipation, uh, retention and protention are kind of automatic, unconscious, necessary features of lived experience. Uh, there's a f there's, I put a quote on your handout from Rodemeyer, kind of just summarizing the the analysis of music, which I won't read out, but uh, in full. But she says musical notes are not experienced as a series of individual independent notes that happen to be played and heard. Uh, my experience gives the notes as reflecting on one another, playing in relation to one another, creating harmonies, etc. I actually experience several notes in their different qualities at once at the same time. Okay, so the, t so the two key points I want to focus on here are that um, gestalt qualities in the sense that the kind of the musical example gives us uh, are emergent properties, the whole is more than the sum of its parts, and gestalt qualities are grounded in these underlying structures which, which really exist, so there really is a set of relations of notes that make up the musical form that we perceive. It's the foundation of the quality. Um, so I want to apply this to the intersubjective case, but um, can't just help ourselves to gestalt qualities wherever we feel like it. So the two, at least the version of gestalt qualities that I'm working with, again, I would be interested in uh, people's thoughts and critique on this, but um, Gestalt qualities, as I understand them, have to be given in the phenomenology of the perception. And secondly, it needs to be shown that if there's a, a similarity, uh, sorry, if that there is a similarity in the phenomenology um, of a perception where the structure remains the same, even if the component parts are changed. So just as a piece of music has, you, we we can perceive it as having as being a similar piece of music, even if all the component parts have changed, if it's just an octave lower, for example. So those, so those two things. Okay, so having given a, like a very elementary sketch of, to remind ourselves of some of the things about, some of the features of Gestalt perception, uh, I want to argue that a non-reductive uh, account of multi-person intersubjectivity can be understood in these terms. Okay, so there's, um, I mean, there's precedent for thinking about human interactions as having gestalt structure. Um, plenty of people looked at how we perceive uh, other people, so a person, as a unified whole, rather than as just a set of characteristics in, par in parallel with one another. Um, but what I'm interested in here is the question of the kind of formal structure of intersubjective interactions, so vis-a-vis -vis the first, second, and third person standpoints that are going on in such interactions. So in order to earn this claim, I want to demonstrate that gestalt qualities are exhibited in the phenomenology of the perception of intersubjective interactions, and I need to demonstrate there's a structure or a form underlying the phenomena in question that produces similar gestalt qualities even if the component parts are changed. <laughs> 
Okay, so in, in terms of the phenomenology, I'd argue that just as a piece of music is unified in consciousness, uh, so too are certain intersubjective interactions between oneself and multiple other parties. So if you consider a conversation between yourself and two others, just as you don't, we don't simply hear the discrete notes of a piece of music as isolated from one another, but the whole, so too when you perceive or engage in a conversation between yourself and others, uh, you don't perceive each contribution in isolation, but you follow the ordered flow of the conversation, perceiving its structure and meaning or sets of meanings as a whole. We hold on to the last contribution in consciousness, and as such, the meaning of the immediately present contribution makes sense. It harmonizes, if you like, in a potential kind of range of different ways. So in this way, perception and engagement of intersubjective reality always involves more than the immediate impression. It involves the retention and protention of the rest of the conversation or communicative interaction. And just as retention is not recollection and pretension is not anticipation, these aspects of encounter in a group are not, so they're not different encounters just added together, but there are elements of each encounter which play a constitutive role in the other immediate encounters, if you like. Of course, there is, there is also straightforward recollection and anticipation that goes on in intersubjective group interaction. But my emphasis is that uh, it's not simply recollection and anticipation that are in play in intersubjectivity. Recollection and anticipation bring content about kind of others or other others into the interaction. But intersubjective retention and protention are structural features of the interactions themselves, not extrinsic add-ons to an otherwise self-contained experience. It's intrinsic. And I think this retention pretension is not only identifiable in cases of dyadic intersubjectivity. I think this is, and this is why it's possible for us to address more than one other person at once. My argument is that the structures of interpersonal reciprocity between subjects, which I'll look at a bit more, uh, so between other subjects can be perceived and engaged as wholes, so uh, the couple as a whole or the seminar group as a whole. So I'll look, I'll look a little bit more at these structures of reciprocity, but just to, to, just to give a few more examples to make the phenomenology side of it concrete. Um, consider an everyday example. Um, imagine uh, being on a train and you perceive um, a pair, and you um, you see immediately that they are um, they're together, they're friends or a couple, and one of them's crying and the other one's comforting, um, and uh, you you see the structures of intersubjective reciprocity between them. Um, you see the kind of comforting and being comforted drama as an immediate whole. And as such, you can meaningfully engage them as a, a use, a, a, a plural subject, is Margaret Gilbert's term. Um, so you might rummage through your bag and give some tissues to the one who's doing the comforting rather than the one who's been comforted. Like that's meaningful because you're giving it to them or to use as a whole. And I think at some level this is quite obvious. Just as Ehrenfeld says, it's obvious that we see we see shapes and hear melodies as wholes. We do this all the time. I think we engage with relational units. Likewise, if we think of the phenomenology of certain interpersonal emotions, such as jealousy. So in the case of interpersonal jealousy, the third person is not an extrinsic or incidental add-on to the emotion, as I think some philosophical analyses sometimes imply, but rather it's the interaction of all three subjects that make possible and intelligible, in, in certain cases, at least. 
and this involves attending to two or more people at the same time, not separate but in parallel, but as a unified system or structure of kind of her in relation to her. Structurally, what is perceived is the reciprocity of awarenesses between, between two others. So in jealousy, or in certain kinds of jealousy, we perceive or imagine a relationship or relationships between others. We see a person's behavior as meaningful, not simply insofar as it's kind of internally consistent or demonstrative of desires and, or, and intentions, but we perceive the behavior as meaningful um, in relation to another. So we see another as a rival or an interloper um, precisely because we see them in the context of this interpersonal whole, just as we see a visual shape as a corner or a contour because of its place within a whole. Um, we, uh, yeah, we don't, you don't, you can't perceive half a rivalry by looking at one person. You can only see the whole rivalry by looking at the whole. So I think this kind of beginnings of a phenomenological analysis give us reason to think that as a participant in interactions with multiple others, we can, we can perceive multiplicities of others as a unity, just as we can perceive a multiplicity of musical notes as a unity. So then to move on to, so that was sort of the phenomenology, to move on to the structure, um, just as musical form has this underlying structure, I think this is also the case in the intersubjective case um, and I've already kind of I've begun to, to talk a little bit about this, but just to make it explicit. So my claim is that in addressing a pair or a group, uh, this is different to addressing each member separately and in parallel, because the object that I address, which is the interpersonal object of the, the second person plural, the use, it has um, this underlying structural form, which I perceive attend to and address as a unified whole. So I can recognize a pair of others as a system of two other subjects held together as a whole uh, by certain structures of reciprocity. So, so whether this is that they are engaged in mutual attention of one another, that would be one, that would be a particular structure. They might be mutually directly attending to one another, or whether they're engaged in joint attention together towards some object or task, um, I'm, able to, I'm able to see that. And as such, I'm able to engage them not simply as two isolated subjects doing their own thing, related by mere contiguity, but I perceive and engage them as, as this whole, structured by a particular pattern. Each individual's behavior is made possible as part of the whole interaction. And that's what makes their behavior intelligible as theirs or yours. So just to make this explicit, there's an, exam an example, and I've kind of, I've put it out on the handout to try and make it clear. So in an example where C attends directly to A and B, so this is a, an I use address, um, ad addressing A and B together. So in this case, A has to be aware of B and B has to be aware of A, and their awareness has to be out in the open. This is Naomi Island's uh, phrase. So the, the, res the intersubjective reciprocity has to be, uh, it has to be that A is aware of B and B is aware of A, and they're both aware that they're aware of each other. So everything has to be out in the open. That's that's what the structure involves. And C attends to A and B under that form, if you like, in that form of, of A and B and their awareness of each other and that, the fact that their awareness is out in the open. is attending to a particular form. And then, and that's what makes the I use address possible. And then if, if A and B were to collectively address C, uh, kind of reciprocally, they would 
together jointly attend to see under the form that uh, C had attended to them. So it's not simply that there are uh, individual dyadic reciprocal awarenesses going on, but there are particular uh, forms of awareness that are being attended to. Um, so there's something, I, there's quite, there's a, yeah, there's a set of very specific um, interpersonal reciprocal awarenesses that produce different intersubjective structures, and these different structures give rise to different gestalt qualities. So this is why I think a second person singular is is different, has a different phenomenology to a, to a second person plural address. And as the forms of intersubjective awareness change, and there's, a cha this, there's this change in underlying structures, this gives rise to a change in the phenomenal, the, a, a different kind of phenomenology to the interaction. So this means that where different component members of an interaction are changed, uh, we can identify similar structures which give rise to similar gestalt qualities. So, um, you know, for example, um, congratulating a couple on their wedding day is very different to having a job interview in front of a panel, but they both have kind of, I think, quite visibly similar I use structures in, in the sense we're talking about um, uh, first, second, third person standpoints. So you can sub the components in and out, but you can identify similar um, phenomenologies. Okay, so so I'm aware I'm taking up more time than I thought. Um, so so far I've I've said that uh, multi-person subjectivity demonstrates gestalt phenomenology, and that there are identifiable underlying structures which give rise to these qualities. So. Just really, really briefly, I'd like to think about this kind of third prong of the triad that we're looking at this conference, um, along with phenomenology and gestalt psychology. That's embodied cognition. Um, and I basically am arguing that the, the phenomenological analysis of non-reductive multipersonal intersubjectivity that I've outlined very briefly is supported by an embodied cognition approach. So um, an embodied cognition approach treats the body as a constraint in one sense, um, compared to traditional models. Uh, we don't perceive, think, or relate from a disembodied standpoint, but from the perspective of the lived situated body. And this is a corrective to the traditional approach, which has tended to treat interaction with the world and with other subjects through the kind of uh, view from nowhere position. So uh, we have to operate within the limits of our em embodied situatedness. And then on the other hand, the embodied cognition approach stresses that the body is not a mere container for the brain, in Shapiro's phrase. So we think, even, we think, perceive, and relate with our whole bodies. Perception is multi, multimodal. Gesture and bodily, bodily orientation are not mere add-ons to thought, but play a constitutive role, etc. So the embodied cognition approach is hence an expansion of the traditional model of cognition as well. And in this vein, uh, those working in the intersection of philosophy and cognitive science uh, have, uh, in, sorry, in, in intersubjectivity, recognize the connection between embodiment and intersubjectivity in lots of different ways that I'm, I won't look at here. Um, but I would say that these discussions have largely been restricted to conclusions about dyadic intersubjectivity, again. And the point I want to press is that um, argumentation grounded in an embodied cognition approach can be given to support a non-reductive account of multi-person intersubjectivity. So the reason for this, um, so said so this, this idea of the constraints of the body, but also the kind of full complexity or expansiveness of embodiment needs to be taken seriously when thinking about what it, what it is to relate intersubject intersubjectively. Um, because intersubjectivity is conditioned by the body, we have to take seriously these limits and these capacities. 
So the limits of embodied awareness mean we can't relate intersubjectively to an unlimited number of people at the same time. And this, this would be a version of the view from nowhere. Um, and this is the, somehow this distinction between what we mean by intersubjectivity proper and somehow mere sociality of the mass um, starts to come into play. But I'm thinking about intersubjectivity uh, kind of with structures of reciprocity here. So as such, the body conditions constraints to the numbers of people we can relate to intersubjectivity intersubjectively at one time. However, we've also got to take seriously the, the sophisticated capacity for coordinated bodily interaction with our environment, including our interpersonal environment, in which multiple perceptions and interactions are integrated into our lived experience. And evidence suggests that we, can't, we cannot relate to indefinite others. Okay, sorry. Evidence suggests that while we can't relate to indefinite others intersubjectively, we can have reciprocal awareness of more than one other at the same time in a triad and in other multi-person configurations of small group size. And there's various kind of, um, as I'm pushing time, I won't read all this out, but um, kind of empir interesting empirical research in developmental psychology um, with infants in triads, which is quite new because uh, kind of developmental research is often just focused on the mother-infant dyad, um, which, which, which kind of supports this idea that um, bodily orientations can be coordinated to address two people at once. Um, so I think the dyadic paradigm that I suggest is still prevalent in the philosophy of intersubjectivity presupposes certain elements of a more traditional model of cognition insofar that neither the capacities nor the constraints of the body are quite taken seriously. On the one hand, the claim that only one person, so one other person can be the focus of my interpersonal attention at any one time, treats the subjectivity of the other as disembodied. Kind of Martin Buber says that the other fills the firma firmament, like the thou has no borders. This sort of this idea that um, the other the view from nowhere almost, and that's how I engage with them. On the other hand, the idea that we can only attend to one other person at once doesn't seem to take seriously um, the capacity of uh, the body for this kind of sophisticated and coordinated uh, embodied awareness. Okay, so I'm gonna end there. But so just to summarize, I've offered that, I've offered something of the, a phenomenal, phenomenological analysis of multi-person interactions. Um, I've, I've argued there's good reason to think we can adopt the language of parts and wholes used by Gestalt theory to understand this. Um, this gives us good reason to reject the claim we can only directly attend to one person at once. There's some empirical evidence for this. Um, and I guess I'd also conclude that while this research purports to be valuable for its own sake, in the philosophy of intersubjectivity, it also functions of an example of how phenomenology, gestalt psychology, and embodied cognition uh, can work together towards a non-reductive analysis of a specific phenomena. Okay, thanks. <laughs>